blink and imagine yourself in 1830, right off the common here at Old Sturbridge Village, in front of a house known as the Parsonage. And inside, there's a great piece I want to show you. Good day, Parson. Good day to you, sir. This corner cupboard, which is located in the parlor, which is the place the entertaining and dining took place. And the interesting thing is, is that it's permanently built in place. It's not a piece that you can move around. Also, it doesn't go all the way back into the corner. It's a little bit shallower. It has this curved back to it. Now, down here on the shelves, look at They're very intricate. And I'm sure that was a lot of work, considering they were all cut out by hand. And the door, very elegant. Even though it was made by hand, still have a, we still have a raised panel, a mortise and tenon joint. And boy, look at this. You can still feel and see all those hand plane marks. Well, I got a lot of good ideas looking at that corner cupboard at Old Sturbridge Village. But when it came time to design a prototype here in the shop, I made one major change, and that was to close in the top section of it. It is supposed to be a display case, so I added some glass as not to block it out completely. And this will also make it easier to keep it clean, keep the dust out of there. Now, the outside of the cabinet is all made from pine, clear pine, and it'll be stained and finished later. But the inside, which I'm going to paint, is made from plywood. And it's not just ordinary plywood. This is a piece of AC plywood. And it paints pretty well, but you still see a texture when it's painted. I'm using a special plywood. It's called medium density overlay. Now, I've ripped the pieces I need for the sides and the back to the right width. And now I need to cut them to length. And I'd like to be able to use my radial arm, but this only comes out 16 inches. And I have an 18-inch piece of stock. So I'm going to cut it over on the table saw. Now, you might say, this is a pretty big piece of wood to cut on the table saw, but it's no problem with my panel cutter, which is just a big T-square. And what I do is set my plywood right in it and align my length mark with the end of the cutter, and then I can make a perfectly square cut every time. OK, now that's the sides and the back cut precisely to length. And now I'm ready to make the shelves. I did take the time to make a template because I want every shelf to come out exactly the same. And what the template represents is the plywood shelf plus its edging and the area for the doors. Now, after checking it out and making sure it's exactly symmetrical and perfect, I can use it to lay out each piece. And I just set it, align it with an edge, and mark it with a nice sharp pencil. I'll even take the time to check it one more time to make sure it matches the template after I've cut it. Now, I will use the radial arm to cut these. And I've set it up at a 45 degree angle. And it just about makes it, but it does a beautiful job. OK, now that little short cut is 90 degrees to the long angle I made in the first pass. And now I need six of these. OK, now I have six shelves, all perfectly identical. And the only way you can really do that is by using a template. That's the key to getting them all the same. Now the next thing I want to do is put a dado in these side pieces into which the back will fit. And I'll do that over on the table saw. I've set it up with the dado head cutter, set it a half inch width, and tilted it a 45 degree angle so that I can make this cut right here. Now, I know it looks like there's not much material left here, but all I need is a little lip right here, which will catch the back of the cabinet like this. 
And when I put it together and glue it, it'll be a very strong joint. And it gives me that perfect seam right down this inside corner. Well, one thing about this piece is that it's a very clumsy piece to put together, this carcass. So I'm using some saw horses, and I've laid out a couple pieces of plywood. And I've taken some of my pipe clamps and just clamped it to the sawhorse so that these pieces won't just slide off the edge. What I really want to do is get everything perfectly aligned. So I'll take a piece of scrap plywood and slip it in that dado that we made. What that does is simulates the back. And what I want to do is make sure that all these pieces, the side and the back, line up perfectly with that corner, just like that. Now I've got to get back to my layout line right there, and I'll drill a hole right at the top edge, and use an inch and a quarter drywall screw to hold it in place. Now I'll put four screws on each shelf, and I'm going to put this bottom, middle, and top all on this side first. bit of glue along the edge of this back piece and that'll help secure it right into that dado. And just slip that in there. Okay, and then I'll fasten the back the same way I did with that first side. Just a few screws aligning it with my layout marks. side is ready to set in place. Now fasten that just like I did the first side. It sort of looks like I'm building a boat, doesn't it? Okay. Now to install the intermediate shelves, I just cut some scraps of pine to the right length that I want between each shelf. And these are just temporary. I clamp the edge ones in and just lean the back ones on there. And what it does is it assures me that the shelves will be perfectly parallel, and it helps hold them in place while I fasten them with the screws. Okay, the next thing I want to do is dress up the edges of these shelves. And to do that, I'm just going to put on a little strip of pine like this. It's mitered at a 45 degree angle. And since all the shelves are exactly the same size, all these little bands are going to be the same size. So I'm going to cut them over in my miter box, which has this extension with an adjustable stop. And not only can I cut square stock, but you can see it's set up also to cut miters. So I know that I can cut six pieces, and they're all going to be exactly the same. Now, to attach these little edge pieces, I just use a little bit of yellow carpenter's glue and some four-penny finish nails. Now, the side of the cabinet that shows here gets a piece of ponderosa pine. And it's the piece that all the moldings are applied to and that the door is hung from. That's a very important piece. Now, if you open the door, you can see that it's not cut just at a square 90 degree angle. In fact, it's cut at half the difference between these two points, which is 22 and a half degrees. So I've set up my table saw with the blade tilted and the fence at the right distance, and I'm ready to rip the two sides. Now, 
Now these side pieces, when they're installed, have to line up right there where the transition and the, that little cleat is. And then back here, I'm going to need a dado so that it'll slip over the side plywood. And I'm going to do that over on the table saw, which is already set up with the dado head cutter and the fence at the right adjustment. bit of glue on every one of the shelves and then I'm ready to slip that side piece on and I'll just nail it in place with some four penny finish nails. Now the three rails, one at the top, one in the middle here, and one at the bottom, are cut at the same 22 degrees that these side pieces were cut at. And I'll just use a little bit of glue and nails to set those in place. I spent a little time this morning setting up to make the doors because I want to glue those up and let them set while I do the molding work. Now let's go over and look at our doors. We have two types, a raised panel on the bottom and a door on the top with a glass insert. And the first thing that I'm going to do is make this little beaded edge along the rails and the styles and that looks like this. And I do that over on the router table which is set up with a quarter inch rounding over bit, and a fence. To hold the panel in place on the bottom doors, I need to make a groove in the styles and the rails. And it looks like this. It's just a quarter inch groove that I make using my dado head and the rip fence set up in the table saw. Now the corners of the doors are joined together with a classic mortise and tenon joint. The styles have a mortise, and it's a blind mortise because it doesn't go all the way through. And the rails will fit into that with a tenon, like this. Now to make that mortise, I use my drill press, which is set up with a mortising attachment. And all that really is, is a square chisel with a drill bit that fits inside. And the drill starts a hole first, and then the chisel squares it off. So as you push down with the drill press, we cut the mortise. Now on all the rails of all the doors, on this molded edge, I need to remove about three-eighths of an inch in depth and about an inch and a quarter in length. So I've set up the table saw with a guide block and the adjustable dado head cutter to do that. And it'll take about two passes on each one. Now with my fence in the same position, but with the blade lowered slightly, I'm going to remove the material for the back side of the tenon on the rails for the top doors only. Okay. Now with the fence still in the same position, but the dado head raised up to a half inch, I want to make a shoulder cut here, away from the molded edge, a half inch deep, and remove this material on all eight rails. Now the last milling operation on the rails for the top doors only is to make this shoulder cut, which is on the molded edge. And I want to remove this material right here. So with the fence in the same position, but the blade slightly lowered, I'm ready to make that cut. Now the shoulder cut on the back side of the rails on the bottom door is offset from the front about a quarter of an inch. So I've moved the fence over and lowered the blade and now I'm ready to do those. Now to get this decorative arch on the top rail, I just trace an outline on the piece and this is where the 
bandsaw really comes in handy. And I'll just freehand it through. Now I'm going to smooth up the inside edges of that cut just using a little drum sander set up in my drill press. Now to put this rounded over edge on the inside of this arch, I just use the router table. But I've removed the fence and I'll use the pilot bearing as a guide. The next thing that I want to do is make a little miter here on this molded edge. So I've tipped the saw to 45 degrees and located a guide block. And now I can run the rails through. Well, now I need to make a miter in the styles in that molded edge. And I do it the same way on the table saw. Well, one more miter cut at the top of the style. And I do that over on the table saw where I've readjusted the fence but left the blade in the same position. Okay, before I can assemble the lower door frames, I need to remove a little more material. I have to take this bead off, this little part right here, not the back. And I'll remove that using the mortising bit in my router table, and later I'll cut the miter by hand. Okay, to finish off that little miter cut, I'm just going to use a sharp utility knife and just take away a little bit of material until it fits perfectly. Now the styles for the top doors need all of this material removed back to the miter, the full width of the board. And I do it again with the router table. Now with the frame for the lower doors loosely fitted, I've cut a blank for the panel. Now this ridge right along this edge around the door conforms to the depth of the groove for the panel. So I've made the blank just a little bit smaller so there's a little bit of room for expansion. Now to raise the panel, I'm going to use my radial arm saw. And it's equipped with a molding head cutter, which is just three cutters on a heavy wheel. And spinning at a relatively high rate of speed, it'll raise the panel in a single pass. Now remember, you always do the end grain first to minimize splintering. At last, I'm ready to assemble the doors. Now, I didn't put any glue on the panel, just on the tenons. And drive these together. Set them up in some clamps and put them aside to dry. I can glue up the glass door frames and put those in the clamps to dry. Okay, now what I'm doing is applying moldings to the cabinet. We go back over to the prototype here and you see there's a wide piece at the bottom and a narrower band that runs all the way up the side, around the top, and right back to the base again. Now this molding is simply sold as window stop at the home center and all the angles that I'm using are the same as I use to build the case. Now with the base applied, I've 45 this corner, 
to accept the narrower mold. So I'll just hold it in its right position, go down to the other end, and mark the length where I want to make my other 45. And I'll just take it over to my miter box, which just has been set at the right angle, and this is where I'll make all my cuts. Okay, that finishes the window stop moldings. Now I'm going to run a band of flat stock just above this molding, all around the top edge. Okay, that takes care of that band. Now I have to put the last run around, which is this crown molding. And that's a little tricky. The thing that you have to remember when you cut crown moldings is that you place them in the miter box upside down. So this is the bottom of the molding, and this is the top. And then you clamp a straight edge on so that the flat surfaces of the molding sit in a perfect relationship with the back of the miter box. That way, every time you make a cut, it'll be in the right position, and all the miters should fit perfectly. Well, now it's back to the doors. Now this rabbit on the back side of the top door will accept the glass panel. Perfect fit. This cabinet has overlapping doors on the top and the bottom. So I need a rabbit on the front of one and on the back of the other. And I do that with my router. Now that was a 22 and a half degree bevel. That's necessary, so the angle of the door exactly matches the angle of the case. Hey, we did it. This piece is almost ready for finish. Well, this first coat is a latex primer. Before I paint the inside a dark blue. I was going to stain the outside, but after seeing that corner cupboard at Sturbridge Village, I think I'm going to paint it a light blue. From the talk I'm hearing around my house, this is going to be a popular project. 